There's the future of the church right there. Amen. Thank you, teachers, for doing such a good job, a good job with the children. Well, good morning. Good morning. Go ahead and open your Bible or Bible apps and turn with me to Proverbs. Yes, we're still in Proverbs. Still in Proverbs. A couple weeks ago when I was here preaching, we were going through Proverbs 1. We're still there because there's big exegetical sections for us to take a look at. And uh, we were looking at, the last time I was here, two weeks ago, Proverbs chapter 1, verses 8 through 19, and we considered the enticement of sinners. And remember, I said if we were teaching children's church, we would say, be careful, little ears, what you hear. Be careful, little eyes, what you see. And be careful, little feet, who you follow. We've got to choose our friends wisely. The world will whisper sweet nothings in our ear and try to drag us away from Christ and they will promise us quick wins, financial success, a shared purse. Right? We have this community where we, where we are accepted for who we are, as we are, and they will ask nothing of us. But we know that the power of greed and the, and the lust for money and the bloodlust they have to just go out and slaughter the innocent was something that ultimately was a trap they were setting for themselves. So that's what the world says. Now Lady Wisdom arrives on the scene 
And this is what she says in Proverbs chapter 1, verses 20 through 33. Go ahead and follow along with me. Wisdom cries aloud in the street. In the markets, she raises her voice. At the head of the noisy streets, she cries out. At the entrance of the city gates, she speaks. How long, O simple ones, will you love being simple? How long will you scoffers delight in their scoffing and fools hate knowledge? So, so she's in the busiest places possible, the most obvious, conspicuous places, and she's causing a scene and she's asking a very pointed question. And then in verse 23, she says this, If you turn at my reproof, behold, I will pour out my spirit to you. I will make my words known to you. And then she already knows what the world is going to say. She knows what the wicked are going to say, and I hope that none of us in this room fall into this category. But she's kind of predicting the future here. Verse 24, Because I have called, and you refused to listen, have stretched out my hand, and no one has heeded. Because you have ignored all of my counsel, and would have none of my reproof, so she's saying, this is what you've done or refused to do. Verse 26, I will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when terror strikes you like a storm, and your calamity comes like a whirlwind when distress and anguish come upon you. Then they will call upon me, but I will not answer. They will seek me diligently. You will not find me. Because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord, would have none of my counsel and despised all of my reproof. Therefore they shall eat the fruit of their way and have their fill of their own devices. For they are, sorry, for the simple are killed by the turning, their turning away and the complacency of fools destroys them. But whoever listens to me will dwell secure and will be at ease without dread of disaster. Let's pray. Father God, unite us with one spirit today. Help us to have a unified faithfulness to you. Help us to be of one mind, of one heart that desires to honor you and love you and serve you with every fiber of our being. Father, help us to heed and listen to and pay careful attention not to leave Lady Wisdom's path. Lord, help us to learn from her warnings. And I pray, Lord, that we would be wise because you have blessed us. And I pray that the flesh would not win. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. A couple of weeks ago, everyone's cell phone went off at the same time, 2.18 p.m. if you were in my neck of the woods. And even though we were warned that there's no national emergency, there's no real threat or danger, and you heard about it from social media, from your friends or family, even your grandma knew that there was a time on a specific day when your phone was going to go off, so just be, be careful that you know that there's no danger. We were still surprised. Some people were still surprised. Some people didn't have their phones muted. They were on the conference call and everybody's phone went nuts. They were driving and they got startled. Some people found phones they thought they had lost. And from what I heard, some people in the Amish and Mennonite community were found out. <laughs> it was inevitable that someone would forget to put their phone on mute. Uh, the notification was designed to let the government reach millions of people, just like that. So that if there were a threat to national security, to the American people, we could be notified in a heartbeat. There would be no delay in our ability to take corrective action, seek shelter, and fortify our castles, if you will. FEMA and the FCC conducted the coordinated test to make sure the technology was working as designed and to see if any improvements were needed. However, there was no national emergency, no real threat, no real danger. There was nothing that you needed to do with that information. It was, as the messages said, just a test. In short, it was much ado about nothing, and yet it was all the media could talk about for a week. Now, if it had not been just a test, it would have been a lifesaver. 
millions of people would have had that much of a jump start on taking corrective action to protect themselves and their family in the event of some sort of catastrophe, um, whether it be man-made or natural disaster. But in the days of Solomon, if you had an urgent message, something that needed to get out to the masses, you didn't have push notifications on your phone. You had carrier pigeon, you had horse riders, couriers, you had the ability to have scribes copy a message and go out into some of the more populated areas and post something in the town square and have that read aloud in case people couldn't read. There was another interesting thing that you could do if you needed to get a message out urgently and quickly. Um, oral communication. At designated um, watch posts along the Royal Road, they would have criers. So they would receive the message, and they would literally be trained in how to project their voice and shout, yell the message to the person at the next post. Now, I don't know how far away that was, but I imagine, um, ouch, I just imagine that being so painful. But they would literally yell to the next person to yell to the next person to yell to the next person, and that's how they got their message out. In the passage we're ju we've just read this morning in Proverbs 1, Lady Wisdom is taking the message out herself. She's running to the heads of the streets. She's at the city gates where they're conduct, conducting all the business. She's at the busiest intersections. She's at a place where everyone is at. She's not on the back roads. She's not out in the highways and byways out in the country. She's at the spot where all the hubbub is going on. And she's causing a scene. She's hooping and hollering, raising her voice. She's disturbing the peace. And she's trying desperately to get the attention of everyone in earshot, begging and pleading for someone to listen, to avoid calamity. She's not subtle. She's not playing Marco Polo. She's front and center. She's conspicuous. She is demanding an audience. She wants to be found, heard, and listened to. And because Lady Wisdom has spoken, it's imperative that we choose whether or not to receive or reject her message. Because Lady Wisdom has spoken, we collectively need to choose for ourselves, for our family, for this church even. Will we listen to her or will we reject her? So why is she so desperate? What is she so freaked out about? Why all the urgency? Why all the noise? Why all the, the charades in the city gate? What is her sermon? She's got a message. What's going on here? Well, essentially, she's offering two choices. You're going to see that time and again in Proverbs. There's, there's this path, and there's the other path. And God is demanding that we make a choice. On one hand, you could accept her reproof, accept her correction, and learn, or you can reject her and suffer the consequences. She cries, how long will you keep acting like a fool? How long will the scoffers enjoy scoffing? How long will the naive or the simple remain simple and naive? She would rather that we repent and reform to her way of thinking, the wise path that she has from God, as opposed to just continuing in our directed course of action that we've chosen for ourselves and suffering all of the consequences. But she's gracious, and, and she's going to give the choice. So option one, verses 24 all the way through 32, a large section is given to option one. Ignore and reject Lady Wisdom. So in act one of this passage, Lady Wisdom is rejected and ignored, and, and she called, but they refused to listen. She offered a helping hand, and no one would have it. Her lungs were filled with a passionate voice, a booming voice. She's got cries of urgency. She's begging and pleading. She's being dramatic. She wants you to follow her. Like, come with me if you want to live sort of deal. Follow me. I have truth from on high. I will save you. Follow me and avoid death and destruction and calamity. And her words were met with deafening silence. The people were naive and content to remain ignorant. Why? Well, Solomon tells us they hated, they despised knowledge and wisdom. And so they just chose to let her words pass right on by. How many times do we read something in Scripture, and we know we probably ought to listen to it, we probably ought to change something, but it's too inconvenient, or we think it's asking too much of us? It's like, nah, I'm going to pick and choose what I want to obey. 
And see, that's foolish. The fool ignored correction, which we learned a couple weeks ago. We need the correction to help bend our spirit to follow God. We need to yield and listen. We need to assume a humble posture so that we can receive correction so that we can continue gaining wisdom. But because these people rejected and ignored her, they're unable to receive the benefits of Lady Wisdom's insight. And so she warns them about what's in store. If you follow this course of action, if you stay on this path, and again, path is a very interesting way of thinking about things, right? Because it's not, it's not a muddy path like we have out here, and it's certainly not the path that's paved and, and, and easy. It, it's more like wagon wheels that have carved a rut. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Maybe you've seen that in a movie. Maybe you've gone hunting and up north and there's just a little two-track somewhere. Tall grass in the middle, but then you got the, the ruts where the wagon wheels would go, or your four-wheel or your side-by-side -side would go. And the interesting thing about that is with the ground being so malleable, so saturated with all of the groundwater and all of the rain, the weight of the carts or the carriage or your four-wheeler in the modern parlance, the weight would sink down where those tires were and they would have ruts carved into the land. You can't go left or right very easily. You're stuck. You're in the ruts. That's why we say living in a rut. And so you're on this path, and you're not going to veer one way or the other. You're in the saddle. And that's what she's warning about. If you continue this course of action, if you continue on this path, there's major consequences to face. And so she knows here's what's going to happen. And so then in Act 2, she tells us how she's going to react if we continue our own course. Her reaction is full of sarcasm. I don't know if you see that here, but it's there. It's palpable. She says, I'm going to laugh at you. I'm going to laugh. Now, it's, it's not a cruel laughter. She's not laughing at their misery and misfortune. It's easy to see it that way, because that's probably what we would do if somebody we tried to warn didn't listen. But rather, Lady Wisdom's laughter is the celebration of God's victory, the celebration of wrong things being righted, the ship being corrected. She's celebrating that God has won. It's, it's also kind of like mockery of, of the winning army making fun of the losers in battle. It's like, hey, you were the bad guys that threatened us, and you didn't know what you were getting into, and now we've won, and now we're going to make fun of you because you're so pathetic. Like, we have won the victory. It's that kind of celebration and mockery. But, but what exactly is she going to laugh at? Well, she's laughing at calamity that's going to come like a whirlwind. This, this idea of calamity is like a burdensome load. Imagine, imagine a donkey or some, some farm animal under the weight and stress of something that's so oppressive, something that is a heavy, heavy load, under which you run the risk of being crushed by it. You see, the wicked, they build up for themselves these massive houses, or they build up this world that works for them, that requires no sacrifice, just living their best life now. It's all about me, 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 and how can I get the most pleasure out of this life and it all comes crashing down on them, and it crushes them. A whirlwind is like a hurricane. Think of Katrina in 05, Sandy in 12, Maria in 17, Ian in 22, all costing hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of lives. One moment, everything is fine. It's calm. You wake up, you make the coffee, you go to work, you come home and have dinner, spend some time with the family, go to bed and you wash, rinse, repeat. Everything's just normal. It's plain Jane, mundane life. And in the blink of an eye, your world is gone. Your loved ones are gone. Your house is gone. The hurricanes come in and it's gone. It's destroyed. Speaking of things that are just coming in the flash of a pan, terror, Lady Wisdom says she's going to laugh because there will be terror that strikes like a storm. And both the words translated terror and the additional context of striking like a storm allow us to see the sudden and intense consequences of rejecting wisdom. Yes, there are some very obvious consequences to rejecting wisdom. Even your lost friends and family will know that certain rejections of wisdom will bring them bad things. Like if you never exercise and never eat any vegetables, you're probably going to have poor health. Some people can at least figure that much out. But there's a lot of other stuff that they can't possibly comprehend because it comes out of nowhere. No 10-day forecast in Israel. No push notifications on their phone. No tornado sirens. Yes, they had wise people who could understand seasons and weather patterns. And you can look at the sky and kind of get a sense that um, today is going to be beautiful in a different way. Right? It's going to be uh, beautiful in a different way. But 
in Palestine, and especially near the water. Storms had a tendency of popping up out of nowhere, and they would be hoacious. They would be violent. They would ruin small villages. And those who refuse to listen to God, who bristle at divine authority in their life, they must walk through life while constantly looking over their shoulder, sleeping with one eye open because they don't know when it's going to strike. She's warning, it's coming. Don't listen to me. This is coming for you. And the key part is, you don't know when it's going to strike. I know this is spooky season, but this is the kind of spooky I want no part of. I don't want this. That, that tension you must live with to realize, I have consequences to pay for my inability or my, my refusal of following Lady Wisdom, and it's going to strike when I least expect it. Lady Wisdom said she's going to laugh at their distress, at their anguish. Distress is this idea of having an adversary, having affliction. Joseph experienced this very same word. He experienced distress when his brothers threw him into a well and sold him into slavery. Anguish carries with it the idea of this extreme pressure. Imagine waking up early to surprise your spouse with some freshly squeezed orange juice. And imagine taking that fruit and squishing it under so much pressure that it has no choice but to yield its life juice. This is what's in store for those who refuse to listen to Lady Wisdom. This amount of pressure that will squeeze you and crush you. Speaking of fruit, Lady Wisdom says that the wicked who refuse to listen to her will eat the fruit of their way. It's a different way of saying they're going to reap what they sow. What goes around comes around. So in the first part of chapter 1, we heard about Solomon talking about how these guys, these wicked men and women, are setting a trap for themselves. They think it's a trap for somebody else, but it's really going to bring their own, down, their own downfall. They're going to kill themselves, essentially. It's going to bring their own death. Now we get a different kind of picture where they're going to eat the fruit of their way. They're going to reap what they sow. They are shooting themselves in the foot. And then she goes on to say that they're going to be killed by their turning away, by their own apostasy, whether it's false teaching that they're listening to or whether it's just a downright refusal to, uh, uh, you know, just partake in anything spiritual. They just want nothing to do with it. Their waywardness is causing self-inflicted wounds. They are bringing this on themselves. All because they didn't take her word seriously. They thought they knew better. They've got this attitude that's so nonchalant, like, you know, I'm just, I'm good right now. I just, I don't need this in my life. And that kind of self-sufficiency, that nonchalance is going to bring their downfall. You know, if you've ever been to one of our state parks or national parks, you've seen we've got signs everywhere to warn us to not be an idiot. Everywhere. There are signs that tell us not to get too close to the edge, not to cross the barrier. Beware of avalanches. Put your food away or you're going to meet Yogi. You don't want that. But the fool says, no, 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 I'm good. I'm good, really, thank you. I appreciate your concern, but I'm good. I got this. I don't need anyone or anything trying to tell me how to live my life. I don't need another boss in my life. I don't want someone else to ruin my fun. I don't want some guilt for not living up to your man-made standards. And these are the people who tragically end up in the news because they didn't read the sign or at least didn't heed the sign. And then their videos go viral and everybody laughs at them. We've seen it. Like the person who didn't take the sign, don't feed the animals, seriously. And while we shouldn't laugh at somebody getting swiped by a you know, 500 pound claw, we're human and we think, well, serves you right. You didn't read the sign, you didn't listen, you didn't take it seriously. And so Lady Wisdom not only responds with sarcasm and she mocks them, she also responds with silence. And this right here, I think, is terrifying. I think this is terrifying. In verses 28 and 29, we, we see that the judgment is final for these uh, wisdom-hating fools. They hated the fear of the Lord. The clock's run out. Time's up. Over. It's done. And the sand, the bottom of the hourglass, there is no more time there's no chance for them to get a second chance. There's no time left for them to cry out again for any sort of help or mercy. The gullible didn't listen, and now everything that they've done has boomeranged. It's come back on them. The life we live today echoes through eternity. How many times have we heard that line in famous battle cry movies? There's a big war scene. The commander's trying to encourage the troops to get up and fight for your king or fight for your country or fight for your lands and your women and your children. 
and somebody inadvertently always says, or sorry, unavoidably always says, what we do today echoes through eternity. And I think there's a lot of truth to that because how we live our life today will impact where we spend eternity. There's a judge. We will have to answer for everything we've done, everything we've said, and everything we've thought. For the fool, the person who sits here even this morning, possibly in this room, and says, no, that's good, Jason, I don't want that. I just don't need that right now. I don't want to sacrifice. I don't want to change. It, there will be a time when it is too late, when you can't repent, when you can't beg for mercy. The foolish reap the deeds that they have sown, and there are going to be fatal consequences. And the cries of the wicked are going to be met with the same deafening silence that Lady Wisdom's words were met with. But that's only one option that's presented for us. Like, that's terrible news. That's terrifying to think there's going to be a time in which I can't ask for forgiveness because I'm dead. It's too late. Like, you can't be in hell already suffering the just penalty for your life and your sin against God and say, oh, you know what? It's actually too hot in here. Not as big of a party as I thought. Hey, on second thought, I think I will say yes to Jesus. That's not how it works. We need to repent now. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. Option 2, verses 23 and 33. Again, when you're taking a look at wisdom literature, it's not like reading another book off the shelf. It's not necessarily chronological or nice in a group little section for us. But option 2 that's on the table for us and for your loved ones and your neighbors and the people you work with is to listen to and embrace Lady Wisdom. So if you embrace Lady Wisdom, even after the warnings and foregone conclusions... There is still that option for us. And if we listen to her, we see in verse 23, if you turn at my reproof, behold, I will pour out my spirit to you. I will make my words known to you. Verse 33, but whoever listens to me will dwell secure and will be at ease without dread of disaster. Now, please don't misunderstand me. The Bible never says, follow Jesus and life will be a bed of roses. The Bible never says, get saved and go to church and read your Bible and you are going to be healthy, wealthy, and wise and you'll have all the money and everything you ever wanted and no one's ever going to make fun of you. In fact, it promises the opposite. Jesus says, follow me. But he also says, pick up your cross. He says, the world hated me. It's going to hate you too. It hated him. It'll hate us. The world rejected him. The world will reject us. Jesus suffered persecution and it should be our joy to suffer persecution for his sake. None of these things are fun. None of these things are quite enjoyable, really. We're being honest. I don't want to sign up for those things. I mean, I did, and I will gladly do it by the power of God's Spirit to let me get through those things. Not exactly what everyone says when they get saved. Oh, I can't wait to suffer. I can't wait to be made fun of. I can't wait to be the black sheep of the family. I can't wait to not get that career advancement because somebody knows what I do on Sundays. Or they know my views on this hot-button issue. But Jesus says it'll be worth it. In verse 23, if you turn and become wise, Lady Wisdom is going to offer to you very freely. She's going to pour out her spirit on you. And you're going to know and understand her words. And we have to see here that when, when, when wisdom, which is personified by God, especially Jesus, right in the New Testament, that pouring out of the spirit, that's conversion. That's when people get the spirit. So you get salvation, you have this new, unique, and, and personal relationship with your creator. How much better is that than gold? Preferable than riches, we read in Proverbs 3.16, which, Lord willing, uh, we may or may not get to, depending on how the pastor search process goes. We will eventually maybe get to Proverbs 3.16. Wisdom is so much better than gold or silver. But one of the things we got to pay attention to here is that this is a conditional offer. She says, if... Right? There, there's a choice. God already knows what we're going to choose, but we are responsible for whether or not we say yes or no to Lady Wisdom. She says that one must turn, listen, keep, or walk in Wisdom's ways to receive the benefits that she offers. That's work. That's not passive. That is very active. Verse 33, we need to listen, and then we get to dwell secure. What a contrast that is to what the wicked have to suffer. They're going to have calamity and terror and all these other bad things strike them out of nowhere. It's not predictable. And yet she offers dwelling secure, 
So that's security. There's peace and quiet. There's this tranquility about resting in wisdom. How joyous that must be to go through your life knowing you don't need to look over your shoulder all the time. You can sleep with both eyes closed as, as opposed to what the wicked have to go through if they want to try to stay ahead of the game and avoid their disaster that's coming for them. Think about Noah and the ark. Safe and secure while all the rest of the world suffers the penalty for judgment. Their calamity struck like a storm. Noah was safe and secure. He listened to wisdom and he dwelt securely. Did you notice who this offer is made to? We know it's a conditional offer, but who is she talking to? Did she go to one person's house? Did she go to the temple? No, she was in the middle of the town. She's in the town square crying. She's at the head of the city gates. She's at every busy intersection, screaming, hooping, and hollering, waving her arms, demanding an audience, and she says, whoever. Jew, Gentile, free, slave, man, woman, it matters not. This is a conditional offer that's applicable to all people. God is saying that whoever listens to him will dwell secure and be at ease. If you're a Christian and you've trusted in Jesus, you've already made your choice. But I would ask, are you keeping on wisdom's path? Or have you strayed? Are you blazing your own trail? Or have you gone back on the path of the wicked? Because it's not too late to course correct by the grace of God. Repent and get back on the path of weighty wisdom. Now, if you've never trusted in Jesus, you don't claim the power of the cross. Instead, you're trusting that somehow you will earn heaven because you are good enough. Or you will claim, I've done more good than I have bad, so I, I'm going to tip the scales in my favor, and so I will earn salvation. If you're thinking, Jason, well, you know, I've never committed one of those cardinal sins, you know, like the big seven the Catholic Church talks about. I've never done the murder. I've never done, like, the really bad things. And so God's going to say, I tried, and, and, and I know you weren't perfect, but you just made some mistakes, and it's okay. I love you, so just come on in. We have to stop messing around with that nonsense. That is not scriptural. God says there is one way to heaven, and it's through his son, Jesus Christ. He lived and died for us. He sacrificed his innocent blood. He forfeit his own life for me and for you if you're a Christian. And if you want to become a Christian, that offer stands just like it does Lady Wisdom crying in the streets. Whoever would listen, whoever would repent and trust in Jesus can have salvation. Dwell securely with the Lord. We have to know that for ourselves and our friends and our family, that the fleeting happiness in this world, it's real. It's happiness. Their money, their toys, their, their however they're gaining pleasure, that's a real thing. But it's happiness, not joy. It's fleeting. It is vanishing like the wind. It will not last. All of their life work built up on all of their pleasure. When it's tested in the fire, it's going to be burned up like wood, hay, and stubble. It will not last. If you are still rejecting authority and ignoring the wisdom of God, if you are still delighting in breaking God's laws, you must know that the fleeting happiness you have in this life is no match for the eternal punishment in the next. In September 1665, the plague came to Irem. It was a small town in England. And it happened because a tailor's assistant opened up a bale of damp cloths and let them dry out by the fire and unfortunately let out a swarm of infected fleas. By the end of the year, 42 of the villagers had died, and by the spring of the next year, 1666, people were making plans to flee the village and seek shelter elsewhere. Makes sense, right? This place is infected. I don't want to live around this anymore. I want to protect me and mine, so let's go somewhere else. And it was at that point when the town really started to lean in that direction, about to pull the trigger on that decision, the village's pastor, William Mompson, intervened, and he persuaded the remaining inhabitants of the village to make a fateful choice. He said, instead of relocating somewhere else and possibly infecting hundreds of others, how about we stay? How about we stay to protect others? How about we stay and we self-isolate? We quarantine the entire village from the rest of England to avoid spreading the plague to others. In one letter, this pastor wrote this, Dear sir, let your dying chaplain recommend this truth to you and your family that no happiness 
nor solid comfort can be found in this veil of tears like living a pious life. And pray ever to retain this rule, never to do anything upon which you dare not first ask God for his blessings upon the success thereof. He's essentially saying, don't do anything hastily, thinking that because it's going to bring you happiness or joy or bring you solid comfort, don't jump and go for that just because it brings you happiness and good things without first asking God for his blessing to make this endeavor successful. The pastor wanted to preserve the life of hundreds, if not thousands of others, and it said, let's just keep this here. Over the course of the next 14 months, the plague raged on, exacting a horrifying death toll among them. According to one account, only 83 ended up surviving out of an original 350 who remained in that village. But their decision to remain and risk death together saved the lives of countless others to whom they might otherwise have spread the plague. Wisdom says one thing and the world says another. The world says Save me and mine. Give me ultimate joy and happiness. Give me all of the good stuff now. And Lady Wisdom says, follow me. She's not promising a life that is free from any sort of uncomfortableness, any, any sort of messiness, any sort of death or sickness. In fact, like I said, the New Testament promises us we will suffer, we will be persecuted against, we will have trials in our life, but it'll be worth it. But Wisdom says you can rest securely. Eternal security is only in the Lord. Obeying wisdom is not without risk, not without effort, not without hardship, but neither is it without its reward. Obeying wisdom earns us the graceful garland for our head and the, and the wonderful pendants around our neck. This is a sign of victory like we heard about a couple weeks ago. This is our opportunity to glory in the Lord, showing the valor of wisdom. Obeying wisdom may even lead to the salvation of others. I mean, let's face it, who in here would be a Christian if somebody else didn't obey and go out and make disciples? I can't tell you how many times the people who canvassed the trailer park I grew up in in my teen years and knocked on all the doors, can't tell you where I'd be if those people didn't come to my house every week knowing that I was going to make fun of them. I can't tell you where I would be if the one guy who even after I kind of toyed with the idea of church, continually tried to get me to think more seriously about what the Bible said and what that meant for my soul and eternal salvation. How many times I laughed in his face and called him some not-so-nice names. I can't tell you where I'd be if somebody else didn't suffer for the sake of wisdom obeying the Lord. No matter what befalls us in this life, whether it's the plague like the one pastor in England or the loss of property and loved ones like Job, we can know that our eternal security is fully vested. It is secured by Christ, and we can live contently following in the wisdom of God, and the wisdom of God is Jesus, personified in the New Testament. So brothers and sisters, I ask you, what's it going to be this morning? Now the obvious knee-jerk reaction is, of course, Pastor Jason, I'm in church. Of course the answer is, I'm going to say yes to Lady Wisdom, but like really, are you going to? Are you going to say yes after you leave the church this morning? Are you going to say yes to wisdom when it gets hard? When you have to lose some money to say yes? When you have to open up your home to someone you might not want to? Are you going to say yes to wisdom? Are you going to follow God's will, will and, and call on your life? What about when the new pastor gets here and the new pastor has good ideas, but they're different than what you're accustomed to? Are you going to fight for your preferences because the church has been here for 30 years and the way we've always done it? I don't know who the next guy is, but are we going to fight for all of our personal preferences? Or are we going to obey the wisdom in Scripture that says we need to hold our pastors and elders in high regard, that we need to uh, allow them to be worthy of double honor, knowing that they're going to give an account for how we lived our life. They're going to give an account for how they shepherded us. What kind of relationship are you guys going to have with your next pastor? I hope you will always say yes to wisdom and not go off and get stuck in the rut of the foolish and the wicked. I praise God if you've already made the decision, if Christ has already called you to repentance and salvation. But none of us are impervious to backsliding. We've all been gung-ho and on fire and totally committed and sold out in three or four different areas of our life for Jesus, for the Bible, for the church, for holiness and personal purity. And then as time goes on, 
we think we slayed the dragon and somehow it grew two more heads and now it's fighting three times as hard as it ever did before. And even you know it, I've been saved for 20, 30 years. I've been saved for 18 months and what I thought I had a good grasp on six months ago, now I'm fighting it all over again. We need to be vigilant and fight for wisdom. We need to fight for the truth of Scripture to, so that we can obey it. If you're not saved this morning, I would just ask that you say yes to wisdom. Wisdom is Jesus Christ. And he also says, come to me and I will give you rest. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, God, thank you, Lord, for this morning. Thank you for your word and Proverbs. Lord, we desire your wisdom, not so that life will be easier for us and not so that we can be puffed up with pride thinking we are so much better than others because we've said yes or because we are wise or because we make good decisions, Lord. But we want to be wise so that we can glorify you and honor you with our life so that our decisions and our words and the way we live our life and carry ourselves in the community and at work, that they can be a testimony to the love of Jesus and how well you take care of us. Father God, please help us to say yes to wisdom. Help us to avoid the deceitful words of the wicked and draw us close to you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.